Welcome to Ortho Insider, the Canadian Orthopedic Association podcast that brings you behind the scenes of orthopedic surgery in Canada. On today's episode, we have Dr. Olufemi Ayeni. He is a professor and academic division head of orthopedic surgery at McMaster University in Canada, and he's also the second president-elect of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. He's an adjunct professor at the Department of Health Research, Methodology, Evidence and Impact, and the chief of adult surgery at McMaster University. He's also the director of the Arthroscopy Collective Sports Medicine Fellowship and the medical director for the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the Canadian Football League and Forge FC of the Canadian Premier League. And Dr. Ayani, you've also just been named a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Joint Preservation and a University Scholar also at McMaster University. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that great introduction and I appreciate you. I'm very, very excited to chat with you today because you are blazing the trails for essentially everything I want to do. And it's wonderful to have somebody who I can follow, hopefully, in your footsteps. First of all, tell us a little bit about your path into orthopedics. Yeah, I know it uh, was an interesting one as far as my path. Um, you know, I, I you know, grew up in a medical family. My dad was a general surgeon and my mom was a teacher who uh, eventually became a homemaker uh, because, you know, five children was a lot of work and my dad was quite busy. And, um, you know, my path... Um, from a, I'll give you two, two sort of versions of it. One is just conceptually how I got into ortho and then what I did afterwards. You know, so my dad, you know, is Femi Senior, I'm Femi Junior, he's a surgeon. So I, initially I thought, okay, I just have to create my own direction and not really go down that medical pathway because, you know, growing up, you know, the questions were, will you be like your dad, you know, Femi Senior, Femi Junior all the time. So I uh, initially wanted to be an archaeologist. So in uh, undergraduate at Western, I was going down that route and, uh, you know, doing some sciences as well, but really pursuing that. And then I went to speak to one of my professors about graduate school, and he said, listen, Canada is very cold. You're not going to do digs in Canada. And so if you really want a profession, you have to go to the States, especially on the West Coast, maybe consider um, other jurisdictions, Latin America, Africa, where the, you, know, you have the more temperate uh, climates where you can do archaeology. And I was only... 21, 22. I wasn't willing to do that at that point. So then I pivoted to say, okay, well, maybe Femi Senior was right. And maybe I am good at, um, you know, the sciences. And of course, in archaeology, um, you know, you do a lot of, uh, you know, morphological studies with bones and whatnot. So I said, well, how can I study that in the living and not the dead? And that is how I started thinking about, well, there may be a field that allows me to medically help and really keep that interest in osteology or bone health. So I pivoted to medical school in Ottawa, and then uh, lucky to get into residency at McMaster, and my interview was memorable because Dr. Banderi was a PGY-5. And then from there, uh, fellowship training with Don Johnson, who was a Canadian legend in sports, and then to special surgery in New York to uh, get introduced to hip arthroscopy. So that's kind of the short version from really multiple pivots and, and getting to a place of uh, career satisfaction. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. I see a lot of parallels to myself because I had the same experience where my dad was a doctor and I wanted to completely dissociate and branch out and make a name for myself, Correct. just like you're saying. Correct. You know, it must be harder for you because you actually shared the same name with your dad, yes. you know, Femi <laughs> Junior, Femi <laughs> exactly. Senior. Exactly. Yeah. But you did eventually find yourself back yeah. into orthopedics and your route is a little bit different than most who have the, you know, classic orthopedic injury because they're a, an yes. athlete type thing. Yes. But it seems as though because you took this route, it's allowed you to become very multi-passionate. And that seems to now reflect in your career. I mean, just even in your intro, you're a team doctor, you do research, you're an excellent clinician, you know, you're paving the way, not just for hip arthroscopy, but also mentorship, your Notch Academy. Yeah. So tell us how you can combine all those passions without getting pulled in too many directions and without burning out. Excellent question. I mean, I, I think that was the second part that I, I hadn't, uh, you know, gone to. And, and you know, I think you know, um, behind all these uh, different roles is the recognition that one, each one requires a team. And my second passion, I would say, is team building. And you know, having grown up with four siblings, uh, I kind of recognize that one, everybody has something to contribute, and people see things differently. And so, you know, growing up and recognizing that, you know. Uh, you know, I had a sibling who, you know, as soon as you gave him a sandwich, he'd cut off all the crust, you know, <laughs> you know? and then I had the other sibling come in and grab all the crust and eat it. And then I'd have one that opened up and go, oh, I, I didn't want tomato. And so I really recognized from an earlier day, in my earlier days, that people see things differently. And so I take that 
perspective into building a team. And so when I look at the medical uh, directorship of the sports teams, I recognize they have to build a team of expertise, strong communicators, those who are really excellent at relating to people. When I look at the research team I've tried to build, I look at really technically strong people who have the research expertise and can execute at a very high level some of the research principles and can really you know, have a good understanding of what I'm interested in. When I look at, for example, the Notch Academy, I'm trying to build a, an audiovisual and social media team. So I think it allows me um, these roles when you can build a team for each you know, project and have them really cross pollinate by having a few people working at, you know, in concurrent teams allows me to keep my interest growing and actually spares the burnout because I have, you know, different interests that, you know, like if one thing is up, the other is down and right versa. So I'm not really, um, you know, dependent on one sphere for success because I recognize that maybe we're doing really, really well this year in medical coverage and maybe research is tough for grants this year, but perhaps clinically we're really strong this year. And, you know, we've mentored some folks this year. So you really have that diversification of your career and that actually may protect you from burnout so that's very important because building a team as you mentioned is crucial it's also one of the hardest things and you gave a lot of great tips on how to choose and making sure you kind of know the ins and outs so just like a sports team you know you're the team doctor of the tiger cats it seems as though the most successful sports teams are the ones whose leader or owner is actively engaged so yourself even though you have a team i assume that you're still very much hands-on and kind of overseeing everything. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, for example, specifically with regards to team coverage as a medical director, what you want to do is, you know, you may appoint some individuals to help you with some day-to-day work, but, you know, you typically will do a stadium visit weekly. You really want to communicate with the senior leadership of the team from the, you know, uh, managing partners to the owner and the head coach so they know. And then when there are critical decisions to be made, you have to be there, right? So, you know, there are some day-to-day activities that, you know, being aware of it is quite important, but important decisions, you really have to be involved and to make sure that, you know, there's consistency of messaging. So, you know, it doesn't, um, you know, mean you can just extract yourself and just pop in once in a while. You really have to be getting the daily reports you really have to be you know and if bringing in a player and talking to that player especially if the player's a high profile player or has some concerns and wants to speak to you directly so you know it, it, it really is um, one of those things whereby it's almost like if you're uh, a faculty member in a program like potentially in a placing a cast on uh, you know by a PGY5 is okay you can let that PGY5 <laughs> put the cast on but if you're doing a procedure like a spinal decompression then you probably want to be there and make sure everything goes was okay so that delegation and relationship building and understanding what you know individuals bring in their skill level competency levels and what's safe it doesn't really travel very far because we do it day, every day in medicine we do it every day where we work so same thing applies to uh, the team coverage work so you talk about communication and that is crucially important in, in not just orthopedics but medicine i have understood that working with sports teams professional sports teams and you work with two of them yeah the communication there can be a lot different than when you're communicating with your peers or your everyday clinic. Is that true? Tell me a little bit about that. And if so, how have you taken those lessons and maybe learned from that and brought that into your leadership skill set? No, well, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, people say things like words matter and they really do. And, you know, if, if you, um, for example, have an example where somebody has an injury and you use nomenclature like, uh, you know, partial tear versus a strain. Conceptually, that can mean something to the player, you know. So you really have to be, um, you know, one, when you onboard your team, have a playbook that you've defined as terms that are appropriate to communicate with in the players, right? So, and the management staff, because some things just reflexively mean things to different people. You would assume if I said strain, that means, okay, a certain um, you know, timeline of return, which is always the, the big challenge. But for others, that could be from their history, their experience, they've heard that word, it means something completely different. So we've tried to get a sense of what is the temperature of the team? Um, do we have individuals who've been injured in the past? And are they sensitized to terms that may mean they're out for the year? So we have a playbook defined and a communication strategy around what do you say around you know players to make sure they feel that they can trust you more importantly they feel that they can be honest with you and and then you're being very accurate while giving good uh, medical care so i think you know in that first part of your question that is the strategy is to you know one on board to define your strategy and then execute and then review at the end of the season 
what communication points didn't go as well, what areas did we have to have multiple discussions, and what did we say or didn't, did not say that kind of made the, the, the uh, communication sort of go a little bit sideways. So that's sort of how we approach it. And um, day to day, I think it's great. I mean, players, you know, like everybody else, our patients, they're on social media, they can Google any condition. So they're coming in more informed than ever. And uh, communicating about injuries means you see the player, you talk to the management, you talk to the agent, you talk potentially to uh, the player once more, and you keep circling back. And if you're consistent with your messaging, things work out. Yeah, that's very interesting. Talking a little bit more about the sports medicine side of things, can you talk a little bit about, about the external pressures in managing an athlete, a pro athlete? And as you mentioned, you know, there's agents involved, there's owners, there's the players, you know, there's salaries. I have not worked with a sports team, so my only context are movies like Any Given Sunday where yeah. that last scene, yeah. you know, the player wants to play because he wants to get the extra tackle to get his bonus. Is that a real life situation and how do you balance all of that? Well, I mean, the key word is balance, and I think those situations do happen where, you know, contracts are incentivized based on performance, and, you know, just like if they told me or you, if you do X amount of surgeries, you get a bonus. Well, clearly, even if we have a, you know, a, a sniffles, we may say, well, maybe we'll push it, you know, so we, you know, so those things, uh, naturally, they're incentives that make people potentially, you know, put their health uh, at a bit of risk to try and achieve those, but I think, um, one, we all recognize athletes play in pain. So that's what they do for a living, and they've done it since they were teenagers. But, you know, I, I would only say that each situation is unique, and you win the communication uh, discussion in the off season. <laughs> so if you're trying to, um, you know, um, call a so-called audible or, you know, uh, discuss with the player why they shouldn't or should not play, and you hadn't built that relationship in the off season, or when they had physicals in the preseason, met them, talked to them, introduced yourself, your strategy, your philosophy, you know, keeping them healthy, and your goal is not just this season, but multiple seasons. Once you establish that rapport, when you have to make those difficult decisions later on, it's a lot smoother, as opposed to not having the relationship, and then just showing up and saying, hey, you're out for six weeks. Now, why? I don't know you. You don't know me. Did you see me? I never see you. In fact, where were you? I signed. So, so that's kind of, so you really have to put, you know, just like in the OR, your, your work is done in the clinic. You've reviewed the x-rays before the case. You've strategized and planned, and then you execute. So in the OR, it's not learning how to do the case. You actually have done the background work to succeed. There's a lot of parallels in terms of, sounds like from that perspective of your life, as well as your clinical work and your academic work, because you talk a lot about putting in the legwork beforehand and you know we're talking years and years and you're now reaping the re rewards of that you know with the Isikos uh, leadership role the COA leadership role you know your tier 2 uh, Canada research chair all these things are coming to fruition for all the aspiring surgeons out there can you talk a little bit about how to niche down how to choose your paths and what are some of the right things or the advice that you would give them to put in that groundwork so that when somebody's mid-career like you, all of a sudden, kind of your trajectory takes off a little bit? You know, I, I think that's a very important question and, um, you know, something that we're getting better in orthopedics. You know, when I, I was starting residency, I'm dating myself, Facebook was just starting and we were, all, you know, so now we're in a different world. And, and I think that part of our training eventually would include understanding how to brand and strategize and really develop your niche. But I would say from my experience is that, um, you know, like anything else, like a financial plan, have a career plan, you know. So when you get into um, your profession, you say, well, in, in five years, let's just say, where do I want to be? And what do I want to be good at? And, you know, what do I enjoy? And then after that, map it out and go, well, after those first five years, what do I want to be? So just thinking about your career is not a day-to-day -day clinic surgery, clinic surgery. Start to take a step back and go, okay, let me just put a financial plan here, uh, a career plan, like a financial plan, and where am I headed? So that's the first thing. This is why I developed the Notch Academy to try and really help push, because this is a very common question, help develop talent, right? And most successful teams draft talented people and develop them and then they become stars like uh, San Antonio for example and other teams in the in the uh, in basketball so I would say that to develop your career niche identification as to what do you really want to be good at meaning do you enjoy it does it compensate you reasonably um, do you get professional satisfaction do you like reading the content matter and going to conferences around that and those are the building blocks of finding what your niche is and um, you know it's a small little example that I uh, did when I was coming up was when I first, you know, I did two fellowships, and um, after my second fellowship, uh, I came back, and I had this triple threat, threat uh, thought process. I could do knee work, 
I could do shoulder work, I could do hip work. So then I was thinking about, well, uh, where do I go in these three joints and focus on? So what I did was I went on PubMed and I clicked in ACL. At that time I saw 10,000 hits. And then I went on and I entered in rotator cuff and I got 5,000 hits. And then I clicked on hip impingement and I got 400 hits. So I thought to myself, well, if I publish four papers on hip impingement, I'll be responsible for 1% of the world's literature. <laughs> and I thought that would be a huge milestone to be responsible for anything that's 1% in the world. So I had that 1% rule in my head to say, okay, well, to do the same thing in rotator cuff work or in ACL surgery, I'd have to publish, you know, 100 plus in ACL. So I thought, okay, well, this is an area that is not saturated has to grow, and there's an opportunity. So then I started aligning my practice to align my research interests. So first identify your niche and then align, because if I was still doing a third of each, and then it'd be difficult to recruit for studies and trials because I'd have that as 30% of my practice, right, or 33%. So I really started pushing my practice to be along the 70%, 80% hip because I wanted to develop that niche and study, investigate, and build. So those are sort of you know strategies that we cover, but more importantly, things you should think about. And your career is organic. It changes. Your interests will change. You'll have external pressures and family and other things. But just consider planning out your career, identifying your niche, identify some key mentors that can develop you and have interest to help you because nothing is ever linear and positive. There are ups and downs for sure. But uh, those are just some steps on the fundamentals of building a successful career. No, that's very smart in terms of working smarter, not just harder, right? Yeah, You've identified yeah. that. I love that 1% rule. I mean, that that's a bit mind-blowing for me, actually, that you said you, you do four papers and you have 1% of the hip preservation literature. That's mind-blowing. And hopefully something, I guess, in terms of your mentorship that you would teach that to the, uh, the new, next generation of, uh, of, of residents. Absolutely. Now, things have changed now. I mean, now FAI has become, you know, <laughs> now, you, now we're in that 3 4%, uh, sorry, 4,000, you know, after the decade fast. But when I was starting out, that's, those are the numbers. But I certainly encourage trainees, uh, early career individuals, and even people who are looking at pivoting to look at, can they develop a craft? And, and I always try to say, well, can I add one paragraph in the orthopedic history of whatever I'm trying to do. So when they, you know, hopefully one day read a textbook on hip impingement, they'll say, well, um, the folks at McMaster and Ayani was involved, built a team and helped to define some evidence. So just try and contribute positively in whatever you choose. So one of the most impressive things that you've done with your career is that is exactly that ability to pivot and to follow your passions a little bit. One of the things that I think gives myself a lot of inspiration is when you came out of residency, you had three publications. Yeah. And now you have more than 400 to your name. Yeah. That is a major pivot for, because for, for anyone who's ever done research uh, or try to do research, especially in residency, you know that is not a simple thing to do. So walk us through that. How did you make that huge change from being a clinician to a clinician scientist? You know, part of it, I think, has just been the journey uh, that I've had pivot-wise, uh, right? So, you know, I grew up in a small town called Capitus Casing, population 10,000 people. And so, you know, uh, just naturally going to London, Ontario at Western was, you know, I was going to a town of almost 400,000. So I've had those dramatic shifts. And likewise, going from somebody interested in, you know, archaeology to medicine. So I recognized earlier on that there would be changes in my journey and have to sort of live in different jurisdictions and, and see different things and, and approach problems differently. But what essentially happened was I got the clinical training that I thought I needed, I arrived, and I sat down with a very supportive chair and, and, uh, and mentor and Dr. Banderi, who said, listen, I mean, um, the evidence is sparse when it comes to hip preservation, and uh, you should consider, and I like that because it wasn't a should or must, it was you should really consider trying to be a leader in this. So that's when I, I went back and did my analysis of the 1% rule, and then it became a passion. And so when you really enjoy something, and you're really driven, and you're uh, motivated, and you have the home support, which is also very important, and your partner or spouse is saying, yes, you should go for it, and cheering you on, then all of a sudden you have full alignment. You have alignment on the family side, you have intellectual alignment, and then you have clinical alignment. So now you're seeing those patients too. And so when everything is aligned, then you can start to really generate some information and, and you know publish. And so... The publication journey is really one of uh, teamwork, mentorship, and collaboration. 
And, um, you know, initially I was collaborating with my mentors that uh, would help me and give me feedback. And then I say, that's wonderful. Then I started involving residents and medical students, and several of them have gone on to have their own great careers. And so that was also very helpful. And then eventually collaborating across jurisdictions across the world. So as long as you're willing to share credit, get feedback, and not take it personally, I thought that really helped me accelerate how things moved along for me. And um, the numbers just come. If you're doing things consistently and you have quality and you have the discipline to stay stick with it, even though it gets difficult. And uh, over time, the numbers, you know, my, my goal was, wow, one day um, I like to see on the PubMed page 20 papers and my name will be on all 20. And, you know, things just <laughs> have changed a little bit. But I think that if you can align your career, have good mentors, and, and I should mention Professor Carlson from Sweden, why did my PhD was also a great mentor who was like, listen, you do great work. I'm going to refine your talent and, you know, build your skills. So, you know, the Bandaris, the Carlsons and, and other in the clinical side, just really have that CEO of mentors and really align your, yourself, you know, clinically with your academic work and, and just collaborate, collaborate, collaborate and network, network, network. And things just happen. And that also goes back to your first comment about surrounding yourself with a really strong team and building yeah. the right people around you. And that's yeah. obviously allowed you to have a flourishing career, which is wonderful. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So you've had all these mentors, you know, going through, you identified several of them. And now that you yourself are on these leadership roles, you know, again, your Isikos uh, leadership, your COA leadership, what is your vision for that? And how do you hope to mentor the next generation? Yeah. You know what? I mean, that's a great question. I, you know, I will always enjoy that part because I, I think, you know, um, even though I have four siblings at number two, of five, and I, I, you know, just going back again in time, and I, I think our, like my parents, what they did is um, one strategy they did that I should probably use myself is whenever we had report cards growing up, they never really asked me how I did. They'd say, okay, what happened to your siblings and how are their school? I'm, well, why are they asking me about my siblings? I'm showing you my grades. So, and then they said, oh, no, we, we don't really want to know about that. We want to know about theirs. So growing up, I had to have this responsibility that I had to look after people who were coming up, who were younger than myself, and I was responsible for their success as well. And then that became a part of me naturally. And so the goal really is in Epic Master and elsewhere, you know, people who reach out and want to develop and, and have similar interests, I'm always happy to help. Uh, graduate student mentorship, always happy to help. And then over the years, what happened was driving home, um, usually between 4.30, 5.36, and I always call my wife, we talk about how was your day and whatnot. And people were reaching out across the globe wanting to talk about their careers and being mentored and being advised, and what should they do in this scenario, and this conflict, and that sort of thing. And then I tell my wife, hey, listen, on Monday, I'm not going to call you because I have a call from, you know, let's say Brazil, for example. And then another year goes by. You know what? On Tuesday as well, I'm not going to talk because there's somebody from Winnipeg who wants to talk to me. And then on Wednesday, so that conversation we used to have every day, five days a week, driving home, you know, um, de-stressing, became one filled with all these phone calls across the world talking about how people should build their careers and advising. So then I recognize that maybe that's not a feasible strategy to, you know, um, have that block of time taken away uh, from, you know, having that conversation and maybe building, you know, a programmatic approach to career development. And that's where the Notch Academy came from. So ideally, there'd be time I could discuss with people and, and but you know with the amount of emails and calls and I d- have a difficult time saying no to things <laughs> coming in I felt with my wife's advice that developing a strategy a platform where you can really learn at your own pace um, you know sort of really understand the anatomy of a career and strategize and build would be something that I'll get into and over the past year since I've been doing that I've really gr- grown I think I've learned a lot and uh, I'm trying to distill all the principles or that I, you know, used to build myself into a program that can help young or any age, really, career folks develop, whether you're in medicine or outside of medicine. So it's an interesting project for me to develop, and I look forward to that. Yeah, so do I. I'm very excited to see how this uh, develops, because I think yeah. you have so much useful information to pass down. If people want to find out more about, you know, the Notch Institute or want to collaborate with you or just kind of have a longer chat with you, what are some ways they can reach out to you? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, professionally and LinkedIn, you can just look me up and, and you'll find me out there. Uh, www.thenotchacademy.com is obviously the resource. 
And um, apart from that, you know, on every publication, my email is always on the call, you know, corresponding author. So you can always reach out that way too. So, you know, I like helping people and it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you could, uh, you know, just see the next generation progress, ascend, and it's, it's always good to see. And, and it's a sort of a mission to just see things get better. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, well, thank you so much for all of your incredible insight. It's been a wonderful pleasure for me to just to learn with you and sit down for you for 25 minutes or so here. I feel like I would be remiss being a COA podcast without asking, so what is your vision for once you become the COA president next year? Well, I mean, I think my key objective is really along that developmental um, you know, uh, concept, which is how could we engage the next generation of orthopedic surgeons, because across the world, um, membership is going down from organizations, and you know, young professionals are feeling, well, what's in it for me? Like, what am I getting out of this organization? So, for me, it's a, you know, a hundred percent engagement, really bringing the concerns of the next generation into public view, um, starting with employment, uh, career development, even talking about curricula, where we have to potentially include other things that are more relevant uh, in their careers. And so, one of the soft goals I have is taking a selfie with every single PGY-1 coming into orthopedics. Uh, that's my mission. I'll try and make that happen across all the great programs. Uh, but really, it's an engagement year for me. How can I represent and take the concerns of all orthopedic surgeons, specifically focusing on the next generation, to say, hey, listen, we have to look after them too. And hopefully, they become engaged, join the COA, play roles like you're doing, which is really wonderful in supporting the organization, and keep advocating for all of our patients, which is probably while we're all in this um, I love that. It's a wonderful wonderful mandate and count me in I'll help you take a selfie with every single not just resident just surgeon <laughs> <laughs> appreciate you appreciate you well Femi thank you again yeah. for being here it's been a wonderful opportunity to chat with you okay. and uh, yeah I'm, sh I'm sure we will uh, continue to see your career flourish looking forward thank yeah. you thank you very much all right